Hello, I'm Fab Bruce Barsley. I'm here today to talk with uh, my guest about uh, the adventures in Regal Land that we had uh, last year. Hi, I'm Helen, and uh, yes, I went to court over a speeding trial last year, and we're here to tell you um, about how we went about getting the, case, the charges dismissed. The first of the basic principles that we used was we tried our best to ensure that we were treated fairly. And we'll refer to this uh, throughout this video. And uh, we did that by asking a series of setup questions. Some of the examples of the setup questions. Um, questions such as, um, am I entitled to a fair and meaningful hearing today? Um, am I entitled to responsive answers to my questions? But we, we finish those questions with yes or no, so that we're asking them to close down their answers because otherwise they can give you very long answers. So that brings us to the first, the first really basic principle that we used, which was asking two basic questions, which, which were evidence of a complaining party, i.e. somebody whose rights um, had been infringed by uh, Helen's behaviour and actions that day, uh, and the second uh, very important uh, question or request for evidence is evidence uh, that the laws and the statutes and the codes apply to Helen. The next uh, principle or, or, or common theme that, uh, that we used was that uh, uh, not being trained lawyers, um, uh, that we don't understand the proceedings that are going on, the cause and nature of the proceedings. And part of their, their rules show that uh, you can only make a plea, a knowing plea, if you understand exactly what it is that you're pleading to, if you understand the cause and nature of the proceedings and uh, the crime that you're um, admitting responsibility for. And as you hadn't been informed, as, as, as we hadn't been informed, of any evidence of the codes applying, as we hadn't been informed of any evidence of a complaining party, uh, we don't fully understand the cause and nature of these proceedings. Mm -hmm. The next general yeah. principle that, that, that applied throughout these whole proceedings was the prosecution has the burden of proof to prove their case, to prove that the laws are applicable and to, to prove that what you, you did was a criminal act. That brings us to the last principle really, which is um, holding the prosecution to account. Uh, if they, they, they don't fulfil their burden of proof, i.e. proving that the laws apply um, with evidence, proving that there is a, a complaining party who has standing to, to file a, a complaint against you, then you hold them to account. And in this country, using the criminal justice procedure rules, there are also guidelines from the Crown Prosecution Service. and. Uh, another thing that uh, we attempt to do is in the criminal justice procedure rules at every hearing they're attempting to move the proceedings on as swiftly as possible and so if we can identify what it is that we want from the prosecution evidence of the laws applying evidence of a complaining party then hopefully um, when we're in preliminary stages they will ask the prosecution to bring forward all that disclosure by a, a, a fixed date and, and hold them to that so that if you don't have that information by a trial that uh, you, you, you start the paper trail. I think it's important to note though it's not easy to get that. You have to ask the right question, which we'll go into more, but you need to ask the right questions at the right time to get them to put an order that it, things have to be provided by a certain date. It didn't just happen by itself, that it yes. was something we had to request. Yes, and also the, the, the paper trail as I said as well, re re recording these things, uh, referring to these things in subsequent pieces of, of paperwork, which kind of brings us right back to, to the beginning, really. And, and what was the first sort of uh, piece of paperwork or, or, or interaction that you had on this matter? Well, the first thing was uh, um, a notification from Sussex Police that a camera had taken a picture of my car travelling at 36 miles an hour and a 30 mile an hour limit. Yeah, I'm looking at this piece of paper and I'm thinking, yeah, I'm not aware of the authority that they hold over me to bring these charges against me. So I, I'm not saying they haven't got it, but I would like to see the evidence of it. Um, so so that, that's where we're starting from. Um, I didn't answer their, their, their letters um, because I didn't see anywhere that, that it explained that they did have authority over me. 
Um, As you've been asking these these, these questions, I, I, I know yeah. I've asked these questions in relation to um, the obligation for tax. Uh, yes. We've also asked the police in, in terms of uh, other offences that they label criminal. Yeah, we visited um, the police station and asked them, uh, asked the chap, nice chap on the desk, uh, how how our obligation is created. So, Very much our section of it, we uphold the law, yeah? Yeah. yeah. So, 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 do you know how your obligation was created? Yeah. Well, I just know what you know, like when you... You know, you, you, yeah, you have to drive within those certain regulations, yeah. but do you know how you agreed to live within that? No. No, I don't I don't know. Know. again, I wouldn't, it would be under an act, wouldn't it? It would have come in under an act. Have you, have you read but, but the But the acts are applicable to you. Did you ever agree to, to abide by the acts? Well, I suppose as, a, as an element <laughs> living in this country is abiding by the act, isn't it? Isn't it? So you agree to our law. So, so, yeah, the question is, because in each area you're within... Uh, so here we're in Worthing Borough Council, yes. yeah. So we have to live by Worthing Borough Council's rules. But Worthing Borough Council isn't a geographical area; it's a no. legal entity. Well, no, criminal law spreads throughout, throughout the nation. There is no. Well, okay. So the UK, no the UK, yeah, we're talking about a, a legal entity. All we kept getting back on our investigation was you need to ask the courts, and unfortunately, you can't ask the courts unless you're up in court. So, so uh, I, when this was an opportunity, really, um, I didn't go out of my way to get a speeding ticket. It was a long time before asking these questions that one came along, but it did. And it's it's a kind of safe way to go in there and, and try this out. And it's been a really interesting experience. Before the plea hearing, went and asked to have a little look around the courtroom, which they found. Now, apparently no one had ever asked to do that before. Uh, they found it quite an unusual request, but they did let me in. I'd gone at a time and there wasn't a trial going on. I just went to get my bearings, uh, so I knew the room before before the trial started. I think that helped a bit. Um, but mostly, I mean, I, I didn't go in there on my own at all. I went in there with my Mackenzie friend, which was you, mm. and I, I went in there with the media rep and other witnesses in the public gallery taking notes and, and recording things, people I trusted to do it fairly. That had several several benefits. One is that you do get a, a fair recording of what's happening in the trial, as we're not allowed to record in UK courts. Um, and they don't either record in a magistrate's court. There is no no actual audio recording. There's only notes. Which, in your case, with the first magistrate's court, was, was, was a great help, because... Uh, uh, well, their court there, record, you know, we've discovered, doesn't always accurately relay what's happened in court and because we had a record ourselves we were able to contest some of that stuff which was very useful. Um, the other benefit it has is, is, is the empowerment of it that you're not on your own you've got people you trust in there with you. If I'd been in there on my own I, would, I wouldn't have been able to do, be as confident and ask questions like I did. Mm. At no point am I pleading not guilty because if they can prove that that what they're bringing to court is a valid charge against me. I'm not. I haven't at any point denied that I drove my car at that speed on that road. It, it's their statute, their rule, that I'm arguing against because I, I don't feel I, I'm a criminal for doing what I did because it was an empty dual carriageway road. And this is the the, the relevance of of the question: Is there evidence of a complaining party? Yes. Because a complaining party is somebody who you infringe their rights of. If if you take something that isn't yours then you give somebody a complaining, uh, standing to be a complaining party. If you hit somebody o over the head with intent, um, you give them standing to be uh, a complaining party. So that's what that, that question is yeah. asking for, is saying, you know, yeah. if, if I, I am a, a, yeah. a criminal, who did I commit the crime against? Yes. How did that pan out at that first magistrate? Um, well, the spokes magistrate got very angry with me. She uh, threatened me with how much it would cost if I continued to delay proceedings when I wasn't delaying any proceedings. I was saying, can I ask? Because she said I wasn't able to answer the question. She, she, she let me ask if it was a fair and meaningful hearing. Yes. She, she wouldn't answer meaningful. She said she would answer, it would be fair. Um, but when I asked her, you know, what evidence they rely on that the laws apply, she said, she said, the laws apply, that's it. Mm. You know, and I, and I was asking to back it in evidence, it was making her very angry. Every time I objected, eventually told me I wasn't allowed to object. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm trying, it's a long time ago now, I'm trying to remember exactly what she said. She, yeah, she was threatening me about the costs of the proceedings. She was telling me that the laws, law applies because the law says so. She was basically using what and, we call a and circular and argument. Do you, were, you, were you being threatened and coerced and uh, placed under extreme duress in that environment? 
But did you plead? No. No, so there, there, there was a plea carried, carried uh, forward. They, they argued that they couldn't actually progress any further without a plea. They wouldn't let me answer the questions because it... They wouldn't answer my questions because it was just a plea hearing. So they said they'd have to have a case management hearing, but they couldn't call a case management hearing without a plea. And, I said, well, I, and they're only supposed to enter a plea on your behalf if you refuse to enter a plea. And I wasn't refusing, I was asking for a bit more clarity on the nature of the charge. But they did, in the end, even though I'm saying that I was very happy to plead guilty if I could see the evidence before me that I definitely committed a crime. That was all I was asking for. Then I, well, I wouldn't happily, but you know, then I would, I would deal with it. I would take responsibility. The next hearing was, was a couple of weeks later, uh, which was the case management hearing. Yeah. Um, and that wasn't before magistrates, was it? it was... No, that was in front of a district judge. Okay. Yeah. And uh, were you able to get your um, basic set-up questions answered so that you were actually able to be treated fairly at that hearing? For me, that hearing was a whole different, you know, experience. He he did allow me the time and space to answer, and he answered fairly responsibly. And as far as I'm concerned, we we got what we needed to actually get these charges dismissed in that case management hearing by him setting some orders, so what holding kind, the prosecution to account. So actually, what kind of confirmations did, did, did you get for when you were uh, actually being treated fairly? I, I just want to say, at that point in the trial was when, you know, when we established that that evidence, you know, so then I, I asked if, so the burden of proof is on the prosecution, they've got to prove the jurisdiction. That I've been asking them to do that, they haven't done it, can they be asked to do that? And Pat taps me and says, get a date. You know, so that's, that's how we held them to got? account. So then I say, you know, so he says, yes, they do need to provide you with, with whatever they're using, you know. Um, and how and, did... And he gave them, well, actually, just before that, they did attempt to give us the evidence, in their opinion, that we were asking for. So they got out the Blackstone, yeah, the Blackstone Criminal Practice 2013, paragraph A8.2, page 147. And it basically states uh, that the laws apply to every, every UK citizen, or every citizen within England and Wales. Yes. Um, and, and, and that's what they read out. But what they're reading out to me is the law. What I'm asking for is the applicability of the law. I'm not denying that they have a law, um, and this is what they find it difficult to get their heads around. So, yes, I know you have that law and you choose to live by it, but you're telling me that I have an obligation, and I'm asking you, OK, how was it created? And in a courtroom, you have to back things up with facts and evidence, and, and that's what they're not able to do, is provide me with any evidence of how <coughs> the obligation was created. As you say, you've been asking this question a long time. So are there any people who you've found who do have an obligation? Uh, well, we've come across, you know, if you come from another country and you do a citizenship exam and to qualify yeah. you to stay, there, it, within that, is an oath of allegiance to the Crown, I think it's to the Crown, no, to the Queen, because mm -hmm. um, yes, that's different. And, um, yeah, so, so they, it, within that, you do take an oath to abide by the laws. and. Uh, so that's a contract, as it were? Yes. So, so if somebody who was in that position went into court, uh, they could then turn around and say, there is your, yeah, you your, agreed, your evidence, yeah. so here is a signed yeah. and witnessed. Okay, um, that's, that's really interesting to know. You managed to get a... a time for the prosecution to give the evidence that you'd established that they have to give you evidence of every element of the crime and that they had to give it to you within a set amount of time. Was yeah, that? he actually put an order on the prosecution to provide me with any and all evidence they were going to use for the trial within 28 days to give me ample time to prepare for the trial. Because your trial wasn't scheduled for a, a further 158 this was, yeah, days. Yeah, this was March and my trial wasn't scheduled until August. Five months so, later. Um, so they were given a month to provide me with the evidence they wanted to use, and uh, yeah, and and that order was put on them. And did you receive uh, any? Did you receive the first of all? Did you receive the information that you wanted within twenty eight days that you requested? No, I received a so letter. It wasn't, it wasn't responsive. I, I received a letter within about fourteen days. Uh, quoting exactly what they'd said in court that had already the district judge accepted as evidence, you know, of applicability of the law. The same thing I quoted a minute ago, the you know the reference to, um, 
yeah, the black stones. So that it just contained that, and then a little a little sentence underneath saying that the bench will take judicial review of this matter, which so means judicial notice. Ju- sorry, it? judicial notice of this matter, which means that they're saying that it a, a bench is able to say actually you don't have to prove that when it's completely self evident that it's true. So that's the argument they're saying. But if something's self evident, surely they can show me. It will let it present itself or show it to me. So the 28 days ran out, all I'd had was that letter. A couple and of months went by. previously, before that, you'd had two witness statements as well, hadn't you? I'd had two witness statements, uh, yeah. Okay. And, uh, when and a picture of my car. And a picture of your car, uh, yeah. allegedly travelling at, uh, yeah. at criminal speeds. Uh, interfering nobody but particles of air. And yeah, empty road. Uh, yeah. Uh, before the trial came, uh, you, you got... Did you get any mail a few days before? Yeah, no, I got their disclosure package 130 days late, four days before the trial, um, with two new witness statements, still no evidence of applicability of the law. Um, so yeah, two so new witnesses had miraculously appeared, and you had uh, no response to the, the questions that by then you'd been asking for yeah. for six months and been entitled to an answer. I mean, within this three is, is a letter stating, I have all the, all the paperwork, we'll make sure everyone can see copies of it, but stating that um, I had seven days to, to call these witnesses uh, to court if I wanted them to be there. Well, they sent it out four days before the trial. So I had to be pretty quick in, in uh, faxing them the next day to say, yes, please, I want all witnesses at the trial. Um, and did a copy to the court. Because we'd already had answers to the opening questions, I, I was just asking them, at the last hearing, the court confirmed that I was entitled to a fair hearing. At the last hearing, the court confirmed that I'm entitled to responsive answers to my question. And I gave them the opportunity to change that if it wasn't the case in this hearing. So I managed to get through a whole load of stuff that we'd already had um, agreed by the district judge. Um, and, and they had to... to um, in yeah. terms of that, that general principle of being treated fairly. Um, and you also you have a, a, a number of questions, you might as well touch on it now, that if you're not being treated fairly, that you start asking. I'm representing myself, you're not representing me. Who are you representing? And so then there are moments they're representing the Crown. Well, if they're representing the, everybody in that room except me and my people supporting me are representing the Crown, including the prosecution. Now, surely that is a conflict of interest. At the trial, they did have the witnesses. Yes, of course, they did. They, they had they two had, of the witnesses. They had two witnesses of the four that they... Yeah, they, the they four that they named and that I'd asked for, two of them were there. It's the first time I've ever cross-examined a witness. He got, he got very um, upset. He was an ex-policeman. They often are the camera technicians, I discovered. Um, but, yeah, he still works for Sussex Police, but not as a police officer. And he examined the camera and the film and is in charge he's just in charge of everything about that camera you know the road markings all of it yeah. so um but what I, the, the questions i'm asking him are about um his legal determinations that that you know having a photograph of my is it of my car on that road constitutes a crime um and, and he, he got quite cross because obviously he'd been a police officer and he was like if you're in with it, west sussex we have jurisdiction over you and and that's that. And so we got into the, well, is, is West Sussex a geographical area or is, is, is Worthing a geographical area? Yeah, you know, I think it's the borough of Worthing on the yes. charge, isn't it? The Petty Sessional oh, District. Petty Sessional Division of Worthing. And I was trying to get them to define, you know, is that that piece of road or is that the legal entity that, that, that governs over that area? Mm. Which, of course, that's what it is. So uh, what I'm asking for is how he knows I'm, I'm within their jurisdiction. Yeah. Um, within that entity known as the Petty Sessional District of Worthing Borough Council, and not merely just present on the land, yeah. which has been known as Worthing since it the last It was there a long time age. before the Petty Sessional Division was, so how did I become part of that? Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, it, he wasn't the most um, uh, responsive witness. No, because um, a lot of the questions sound very similar. They start with the same phrase, and then they're, they're asking a question about standing or complaining party or jurisdiction. So the, the main context of the question changes, but, but they're, they're the same question over a different element of the charge because mm. we need to get answers for all of them. Well, because he's not paying attention proper, properly and obviously nor are the magistrates, he thinks I'm repeating my question. And, and uh, Some questions I am repeating because he, he's answering with a load of waffle 
when it's a simple yes or no answer. So I'm repeating it and asking him if I could have, because I don't really understand the jargon he's using, could I have a yes or no answer? And he would eventually give me one if I pushed for it. Sometimes it would take me three times. And then I was told I was delaying things. So, so I just politely said that, you know, if you answer my question responsibly the first time, it will go through a lot quicker. But then I got accused of repeating myself again, and I hadn't. They were entirely different contexts to each question. They just and sounded, you the wording three, was similar. You repeated uh, yeah, all and I had three to repeat all three to the court to establish that they were very, actually very different questions. There were you know, a number of, of questions that uh, were quite relevant. That they, they, they were questioning um, exactly how relevant it was to establish every time the camera flashed whether uh, somebody had committed an offence. Which is what the yeah, uh, and he said yes, absolutely. Every time a camera flashes, an offence has been committed. Well, clearly that's not true, because they must have emergency services going through there. They must have other uh, a diplomatic car. Um, you know, there, there, there's all sorts of examples where where there are exemptions from that rule. So, rather than just identifying the exemptions, what I would like to know is where the obligation comes from. So, you know, if some people are exempt and some people aren't, those people must have an obligation. Where is it? You yeah. know, so it's, it's just so he wasn't going actually back able, to that point. He wasn't actually able to bring forth any personal first-hand knowledge or evidence of the applicability of the Road Traffic Act, as that no. was what was... He, he, he didn't and, know how and, my obligation was created. And for the second witness, that was pretty much the same. It was pretty much cut and dry. All he'd ever done was hand post a notice through my door, so... There wasn't really much. And he um, didn't make a legal determination. No, I asked him if he was making any legal that. determinations, and he said he wasn't. So we didn't we didn't spend much time with him. Okay, and at that point, I mean, it would have been nearly two hours into the proceedings, or, yeah. or maybe a little bit, uh, you know, about two hours into the proceedings, I think. And they tried to call a third witness. No, enter uh, a witness a, statement. Written witness statements that you'd uh-huh. only seen uh, a few days before and that were well behind the due disclosure date, yeah. as, as ruled by the district judge. Yes. So, what happened You objected very, I very, objected. very firm, yeah. firmly. And, uh, I remember that. Yeah, and... Um, That's they, where the proceedings started the first to get all, a they, Mickey Mouse. They I, asked I me about, um, you know, are your questions relevant or, and all this, mm. and, uh, and, and I said I want to question on their competence and credibility. Everybody has the right to question any witness that ever stands against them. So, you know, I knew... On their that, competence and credibility yeah. and the veracity of their statements, the veracity yeah, of their testimony. the veracity of their statement, yeah. So a- everybody can do that. So the fact they weren't there was an abuse process. So, so I was saying, no, I'm not happy to accept that. I requested them be here despite them putting the evidence in 130 days. They, you know, what are you going to do about them putting in their evidence 130 days outside the 28-day court order? Come on, let's have some answers. Yeah. And they said, well, you've already, if you're going to insist with this line, it's an, it's an abuse of process. Yes. And we'll have to have a separate hearing an abuse of process hearing in order to establish whether an abuse of process has taken place. So I said, okay, I think we should do that. Yep. And uh, that, that brought a halt to the proceedings for, for that day. Well, it, it, it brought a halt of. to any meaningful proceeding. They, they then proceeded to spend 45 minutes attempting to... Well, they gave uh, me a good telling off. They said to me... Because also earlier, with, with trying to prove, the magistrate had said to me, uh, well... Surely your driving license is your obligation. Well, it's not. I've, I've dri- we, you know, we have, we, it's we've done our research. Contract. It's not a valid re- contract, and they'll confirm that with you. Um, and then he said, my passport, which I, uh, I said, I don't have one, which I don't. But even if I did, it's again not a valid contract. Um, and then he tried my birth certificate. So something my parents did before I've got any conscious memory is my obligation, and, and no one bothered to inform me of it. Um, so, and then I mean, that he makes, tried my that car makes a, insurance. That which makes is even around more as absurd. much sense uh, with a birth certificate as um, in North Korea. I believe they punish three generations for one person's yeah. alleged crime. Well, I'm a slave. So that if would my be, obligation was created at my birth. Well, in that case, it would make around as much sense as if your parents uh, chopped off somebody's head. You being responsible for that crime. Yeah. Um, and and that was clearly demonstrated with the court, but they persisted still. Uh, even after that with car insurance. And yeah, car insurance, how absurd is that? I get my car insurance because if I hurt somebody, it's covered, or if I hurt myself, or, 
whatever. You know, it's to protect for accidents. That's why people have car insurance. The fact they've made it a legal obligation is is something it's aside to that, matter. really. So to ask me if my car insurance is my obligation to abide by the road traffic act seems a bit peculiar. It's like they were clutching at straws. We then get uh, another hearing, uh, a notification of another hearing, because the prosecution has yes, we get stated that their, their remaining witnesses aren't available. No, the second, that's the one we just talked through, is the one where the witnesses weren't available. Right, we right. went then get a letter saying that we're going to have another rescheduling hearing because the prosecutor's off sick. Yes. Um, and so it's only like like the bench. It needs to it needs to be everybody the same as it was in the beginning of the trial for the trial to continue. So it can't continue, which is just a couple of days after they said the witnesses aren't available. No, they rang in court, didn't they? They rung the mm. witnesses from the court and discovered the witnesses were available. And With that's help why from your information. Yeah, because and um, what had happened is they'd been called on the wrong day. They'd been called to the abuse of process hearing that that couldn't happen. It was a farce. Anyway, with my help, um, they, the legal clerk got them to call the witnesses in court and the witnesses were available for the trial on the 11th of October. So it was agreed that it would all go ahead. And then we got this next one saying the prosecution was off sick, so could we delay the trial? It, it just seemed a bit absurd. And uh, well, so already been we complained, of... actually, because at, at, they were saying we discovered that she'd been off for a couple of weeks, a few weeks, in, you know, and in that time we'd had a hearing where they could have brought that matter to the table and didn't. Um, and we said, we've been told it absolutely has to finish. I've been to court this many times, and we were in front of a lady district judge this time, mm -hmm. and, and she, she absolutely agreed with us and said, no, this, they've had ample time to let us know she's off sick. They've left it to a couple of days before the trial. They've already tried once to have a rescheduling. No, I'm not going to allow it. The trial goes ahead on Friday. Well, then on Thursday afternoon, that was the Tuesday, the trial was on the Friday. On Thursday afternoon, I get a call from the court. You won't be needed in court in the morning because your hearing has been rescheduled. Who made a ruling in between then and Thursday without me being notified it was taking place and without me being consulted to say that the trial is no longer taking place? And nobody could answer that question. So, we'd, so we said, well, we'll turn up. And they said, well, it'll be a rescheduling hearing. So we turn up on the day that they've absolutely ordered me to be there, give me a big telling off about it will be dealt with. The magistrates didn't turn up. The legal clerk had been moved to another town. The prosecutor was still off sick and there was no witnesses. So, you know, nobody except us turned up. We were put in front of a bench of magistrates who took one look at it and said, uh, we can't deal with this. You know, this, you know, there's nothing we can do. Um, and eventually we go in front of a district judge. So we, we wait around who, who, and we have another hearing. Who would have been our fourth district judge, but actually he was our first and fourth district judge again. Yes, the, the same the guy. District judge. We were fortunate enough that day to get um, the same district judge, that, but the court order on the prosecution five months previously, six months by then previously, uh, to provide me with evidence. He was very surprised to see me. Uh, even more surprised when he saw the amount of hearings I'd attended. And uh, he actually uh, he pointed me in the direction of the criminal procedure rules and the ones that are uh, about a speedy trial, the ones about, um, because actually a trial should be started and finished within four weeks, unless, you know, with, there's reasonable grounds to delay it. This went on for nine or ten before it, it, it got got resolved. So so there was all sorts of breaches there, the fact they hadn't provided me with evidence, they'd broken his orders. So he told me to write a chronology, he... he he told me to write a chronology, but as an order, if I no no, he said I'm requesting you do it. I don't you don't have to do it, but we'll write on the record if you're agreeable. He said if you can, because you're the only person who's been present in every hearing, and if you could write a list and you've got all your paperwork of everything that's happened, submit it to the court and the prosecution, and they have to argue against it if they think it's not accurate. The first magistrates you had, and well, in fact, both sets of magistrates you had weren't always most uh, agreeable and cooperative. Uh, you found most of the district judges that you'd had, um, though quite bemused by the state of your case, um, were actually fairly patient with you uh, along the way. So we'd had three different prosecutors uh, who'd come to the three rescheduling hearings with the district judges, and we had a, a, another prosecutor for the first two hearings. So. Yeah, so this is the one that we'd been trying, waiting to come back off sick so we could get on and, and get the case dealt with. Um, well, she started by saying, you've got me on the back foot, Missy. Yeah. 
it's kind of it's a strange thing, you know. It's not 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 where I intended to be. I just want to get on with it, you know. But um, the analogy is the analogy is a fencing analogy, isn't it? You've beaten me, sort of. You know, I'm which way do I fall? Um, so we knew immediately that you know we've actually we we we, we kind of knew anyway. The paperwork was really strong. They, you know, they don't know how to do their job. If you make them do a job. They will mess it up, I reckon, most of and the time. And you, you picked out the parts of the, the criminal procedure rules that you'd marked out. Now, Section 1 of the criminal procedure rules, it generally refers to um, what the objective of uh, any criminal trial, any criminal procedure is. The second part refers to people's obligations within that, the obligations of the prosecution, the defence and the bench. And the third part is the stipulations within that. Now, a large number of those have the judge may or the bench may, at his discretion, mm. order or make certain stipulations. But there are a number also there that are must. Yes, yeah, where it, the bench it, it must. makes a big difference. You know, if you look at the criminal procedure rules, look for the wording, whether it's a must or a may, because if it's a must, you can hold them to it. Yeah, and in this case, uh, a district judge or a magistrate may make a court order. If a district judge or a magistrate makes a court order, and in this case they made the district judge made an order for uh, disclosure to be made within 28 days, the magistrates made um, a court order for a response within 14 days of receipt of the uh, abuse of process argument. So there were two court orders, and if a court order is breached, the bench must address it, and so that was that that yeah. that was why there that they, the the prosecutor must so, have known that and realised that was why she was. Well, on no, the she, they they know their way of trying to deal with it was she said her witnesses didn't turn up, which which it's obvious that they didn't bring the witnesses because to bring the witnesses is a huge unnecessary expense. But you know her comments, you've got me on the back foot. Don't suggest I haven't got my witnesses. It suggests I don't. I don't have my evidence and that you've been asking for, so that I can make a valid charge against you. Yeah, and um, and it became very clear when the when the magistrates did arrive and and the trial started to resume, part of her trial finally, um, that uh, that that the very clearly had been an abusive process. In fact, the magistrates were asking me if I wanted to continue into an abusive process hearing there and then. Uh, uh, and so I needed to clarify where we were at, and I said, are, are, the, case, are the charges against me dismissed? They said, yes, they are. I'm free to go. Yes, you are. They said, then I've got no interest in any further hearings. I uh, would just like to be compensated for the, yeah, the, yeah, the time uh, and and Then we asked expense. about expenses. Um, we weren't at all sure that we would get expenses, but um, you know, we put a lot of time and effort. You know, It hasn't just been what we're talking about and we'll get onto that in a minute about some of the other things we do um, to, to prepare us for court and the help we've had and support um, so yeah so uh, we asked for £900 expenses and, and I expected to uh, re meet a lot of resistance over that and I didn't um, they were very polite through the whole thing They, I thought they might bring me a cup of tea at one point you know <laughs> it was so different you know normally I'm ordered to the back or stood in the dock and because because we proved that we weren't being treated fairly suddenly, we were up the front of the court, everybody's being ever so polite, helping me. They're, they're responding to my Mackenzie friend, who they, you know, Fabris, who they absolutely ignored up until that point. Um, they allow him to talk to me, he's not allowed to address the court, and all of a sudden it's good morning, Mr. Bardsley. You know, and yeah, total change of attitude because, you know, um, because they'd sat there before and told me absolutely, you know, that magistrate that had to speak to me that day was the one that was saying, they will respond to you, they will respond to you. And I'm saying, what, they don't? And he's thinking that it's the most outrageous question I've ever asked. But yet, uh, yeah, a few weeks later, um, they we didn't are. respond and, yeah. and, and, and your case has been brought So the, the only argument over costs was whether it was a wasted costs order, which comes out of the prosecution's budget, or a central costs order, which comes out of everybody's budget. And it was finally agreed that it would be a uh, central costs order. I think the legal clerk was very clear with them that they, she um, wanted it to be that because she was aware that the courts had also abused the process. They'd called wrong hearings, they'd made mistakes, they'd called hearings that weren't the right type of hearing and didn't have the right people there. You know, there was a whole list of mistakes that she herself was really responsible for and she knew we'd left them alone. So I think the court she, and the bench, yeah, yeah. They took equal responsibility in the end. In order to get my expenses, I still haven't got my £900. We are working on this and I'm sure we'll update you as soon as it comes through. But what we have got is a defence costs order 
which um, it's asking me uh, to fill out a form, which we've done. There's a form attached here, but I filled out a different copy of the same form, sent it back to them. And it says here, the court has ordered that your expenses be met from central funds. The amount to be paid is subject to assessment by a member of court staff in accordance with published rates of allowances. So nowhere does it say the £900. Uh, in court, they did confirm £900, but they did say to me it has to be approved by the national taxing team. So we'll see if they argue that amount, but we obviously have evidence here that we won that case. The methods aren't originally our own. We, we've been studying with people in the States and Australia. Well, that was what I was going to mention in terms of, uh, you, you mentioned going and visiting the court beforehand. and uh, Taking people in with me. All these tips came and also, from... And also yeah. the, the uh, going to see the court, but also playing with the court in the theatre, in your, in your mind, Role with your playing. friends, with... Role-playing yeah. is brilliant, you know, because uh, uh, these methods come from, really, from Mark Stevens. Um, Adventures in Legal Land was his first book, and Government Indicted is his new one. Yeah, and, and www.markstevens.net. Yeah, get a good plug in there, because, you know, we, none of this work, you know, this work all originates from Mark's simple set of questions and his book and his... Uh, he has, a, he has a Skype chat called the No Stake Projects Room where Frank we've Rizzo's, met a lot of... Yeah, yeah. Frank Rizzo 3, if you want to Third, join it. Frank, Frank Rizzo, Rizzo 3. Three. Um, um, send, on, on Skype, Skype just ask. send him a, a, a message. And, but uh, there's a few hundred people on there, I think, probably all together, or maybe a bit less. Um, and there's some, some, some good people some there. some great people there that offer you loads of support. You can do free Skype calls where we try out every scenario that could possibly happen in court so that we're really well prepared. It does take time. You've got to be quite invested in, in this. But once, once you know, you realise that, you know, there is no obligation, it, it does, um, yeah, it, for me, it, it means I want to carry on and put the time and energy. I, I, I actually care when someone comes after me and wants to take my money or put penalty points on my licence and I don't feel like I've committed a crime, then I'm going to stand up for myself and make them prove it and they weren't able to. But they, I couldn't have done it without the help of all the guys in the chat room the phone calls at strange hours of the night because we're all on other different parts of the world. I recorded calls, recorded every single phone call. And actually at one point Mark over in Arizona was ringing them on my behalf. Because it does help to have, you know, for them to know you're not you're not defending your case entirely on your own. You're just representing yourself in court. doesn't mean you're not going to get help, you know. It just means you're not going to use a solicitor. To be fair, I expected to come away with a fine and um, the costs and points on my licence because I thought they'd just do it anyway. But actually... If you can hold them to account, and it really helped to have that district judge. But I think you can get a lot, uh, you know, if you get somebody who isn't, who is fair enough to hear you, you can ask them those questions, which puts them in a double bind that jurisdiction is an element of a crime and and, and they've got to prove it. You know, that I'm innocent or proven guilty, burden of proofs on the prosecution. You know, if you can get all that agreed to, but you can't just ask those three questions and get them answered, you need to use some set-up questions to, mm -hmm. so people understand where you're coming from. You need to establish that you want responsive answers to your questions, you want a fair hearing, you know. And that's what Mark has helped us so much with and, and all the no-stake versus to the set-up questions that mean you get your questions answered because just walking in there and asking those questions, they're not going to answer them. But if they've already told you they're going to answer your questions as long as they're relevant to the case and they've already told you they're going to give you a fair hearing, it's really then difficult for them not to continue answering questions that aren't relevant. It's a shame when it's being used for what appears to be blatant economic shakedown because it brings the rest of the judicial system into repute where um, trivial offences are being uh, um, encouraged and, and they're, they're going right out their way with cameras and enforcement officers for completely and utterly victimless crimes which actually take away the resources where they're really needed to, 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 to deal with the socially damaging crimes that, that, that we all know and, and, and hope not to hear about. So we will wait and see if we get our full £900 costs. We're hopeful we might, but, you know, the, the, bearing aside we weren't expecting, you know, the result was, was the one we hoped for. It was, it was the best we thought we could get, so we thought we'd share it with you. Yeah, thank you.